first thing, the biz biggest mistake that I think a lot of people, uh, job seekers do is failing to research their target roles uh, before writing their resume. So if you don't know what skills and knowledge your potential employers are looking for, then it'll be difficult to write a resume that will uh, ben you know, benefit you and impress them. So before you start to write your resume, you need to hit the job boards, um, you know, and do your research beforehand. Like, uh, look at LinkedIn, Indeed, and Glassdoor to browse through um, a lot of the relevant roles in your industry that you're looking for. Um, you know, take notes of the candidate requirements that keep appearing and make a list of those so you can add those to your resume. Um, focus on hard skills, you know, such as industry specific skills, IT system knowledge, languages, and those type of qualifications. Um, don't worry about soft skills too much. You know, they're great to have, but applicable to, you know, in most jobs that you'll be doing. Um, we're looking, you know, for more of the hardcore content that will help you and um, will, recruiters will be looking at. Um, so definitely also look into the company's mission, values, and culture uh, to see if it's a right fit for you as well. So definitely do your research. Um, next slide. Um, and here I wanted to go over just, uh, you know, you know, some resume basics, um, you know, the purpose of your resume is to provide a summary of your experiences, abilities, skills, as well as accomplishments. So uh, whether you have a paper version or an electronic version, you know, your resume is a tool for you to basically sell yourself to your prospective employers. So if your resume is done correctly, you know, you will end up getting an interview. So. Um, really, your resume should look flawless, professional, easy to read, um, you know, for busy recruiters to navigate and find the information they need. Um, really getting started, you know, using Microsoft Word or Google Docs is something easy to use to create your resume. Um, and it's a globally recognized platform, you know, for uh, resumes across all industries. Uh, once you have your resume finished and ready to send out, uh, be sure to convert it to PDF format. Um, and save, you know, your Word doc for future updates because you will be updating that along the way. I learned the hard way uh, once not saving it and having to start all over. So definitely save it and then send out the PDF version. It's just easier to open up um, once you're applying. Um, and yeah, basically keep a simple uh, one column format by sticking to, you know, a clean, crisp, font. Um, you want it to be easy to read. Um, I, like I would recommend using Times New Roman um, for the font and color scheme. Black text on white background is best. Don't be tempted to use, you know, those fancy fonts and any kind of wacky color schemes to try to stand out. Um, this will just look unprofessional and, you know, could make your resume difficult to read. So keep it basic and clean. Um, for the length, my rule of thumb is one to two pages uh, is enough to tell your story and, you know, not bore your readers. Uh, remember that recruiters and hiring managers read hundreds of resumes a day. So try to keep it concise um, if you want to hold their attention. Um, something to think about is a resume gets less than 10 seconds, you know, to wow the recruiter. So try to make it, you know, pop in the beginning. Um, Use bold headings to divide the sections of your resume. This will also help the recruiters to navigate it when they're, uh, you know, skim reading through everything. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, keep consistent uh, numbers for uh, your bullet points. Um, and yeah, so those are some like resume basics to keep uh, to think about when you're writing it. Next slide, please. And here I wanted to discuss the different sections uh, when you're, you know, writing everything out uh, for the structure. Uh, once you have a format of your resume, you'll need to structure it in a way that will draw the attention to most of your valuable skills and just create a pleasant reading experience overall. So uh, always, you know, be sure to have your contact info uh, and your name and contact details should sit at the very top of your resume so that recruiters can easily see how to contact you. Uh, you don't need to include your address, uh, date of birth, or photo, or anything like that. You don't want to waste valuable space. Um, but do consider including your LinkedIn profile so that potential employers have multiple ways of reaching you. Um, and LinkedIn is one of my top tools that I uh, use to look at profiles. So definitely put that at the top as well. 
Um, and then within your profile summary, uh, since employers, you know, may only spend a short time reviewing your resume, you want to display your positive qualities here concisely. Uh, a brief introductory paragraph that summarizes, you know, your overall skills, experiences, and abilities um, is a great place to put here to grab the recruiter's attention uh, when they open your resume and definitely a spot where I go to in the beginning as well. It's just a nice overview to have of your industry specific skills. So keep it short and sharp. Uh, I would say four to five sentences should be enough. Um, and if you are open to relocating, uh, you should mention it here as well. Um, and then with uh, your work experience, you know, you just kind of give an overview uh, and it's a great opportunity to demonstrate your skills in the workplace, you know, what impact you provided to your employer. Um, you know, you should list it from most recent to oldest to showcase, you know, what skills you have. And a lot of employers and recruiters look at your most recent experience of what you've been doing that would be relevant um, to the role at hand. So. Um, yeah, so definitely put that down and keep it again, short, uh, more active words in, I would provide like metrics and everything like that. Um, you know, and if you don't have any direct paid work experience, you can add any voluntary roles or part-time jobs or, um, examples like that, that you've worked to support a company organization in your work experience. Um, Let's see, and then with education, um, you can either put it on the top if you're just going into the workforce, you know, entry level people um, can put it on the top to showcase. Uh, but if you are more experienced, you can uh, list your education at the bottom. Um, I know with hobbies and interests, um, this can be an optional section that you can uh, showcase uh, to include if you have any positive, that will have a positive effect on your application. So. If you have interests that are related to your targeted roles, that would be beneficial to include. For example, um, you, if you're applying to a writing position and you run your own blog, this will give you a chance to showcase more re relevant skills and experience with that. Um, and it can also help include, um, you know, with in, in any impressive achievements like running a marathon or raising money for charity. Uh, these types of achievements also showcase, uh, you know, how driven you are and uh, will help you stand out if you have any limited experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here I just wanted to quickly show kind of uh, on the left, uh, just a resume format that you can find on Indeed <clears> of <throat> how everything should look like, you know, with your name uh, and contact information at the top, and then a summary in the middle, and then uh, proceed to your professional history, where you name out, you know, the company name, dates of your tenure, um, and just descriptions of the role and achievements you've provided, um, you know, in concise bullet points. And then you would put in your education, your skills, and optional um, hobbies and interests at the bottom. Um, and then just another showcase on your right, just LinkedIn is also a great place to kind of help you write your resume as well, since you're doing everything pretty similar. I just put mine as an example, uh, you know, showing at the top, um, you know, I'm a senior talent acquisition recruiter at Big Commerce, and then it's nice to have an about section, kind of what you've been doing um, overall in your experience, and then running down through your work experience, and also keeping that up to date with bullet points, because recruiters do look at that. That's like one of the first things they look at once you get a resume is you look at their LinkedIn profile as well. So just a rule of thumb to keep that updated as well. Next slide, please. Um, and here, really quickly, we wanted to, just to go over, um, you know, best practices for writing a resume. Um, I think it's not needed. You can leave off your references on your resume. This will help you save space and also, you know, preserve the privacy of your professional context. Um, you know, you can put in uh, references provided if needed and, you know, your employer, uh, the employers and the recruiters will ask you if they need them, but I wouldn't, I would leave that off. Um, also, just make sure to keep roles relevant in the industry experience and that you're showcasing only the roles in the past 10 years. Um, you know, I'm sure you've done a lot more within uh, your work experience, but you just want to keep it relevant and, you know, not bore your readers. Um, use as few words as possible. Keep it clear. Use strong, active verbs throughout. Um, you know, use the keywords uh, that employers are using in their job descriptions as well. That helps. 
uh, when we're perusing through resumes, uh, be sure not to lie. You know, they will find that out throughout the interview experience. Um, so be sure to just put in relevant experience that you've done. Um, also, just be sure to edit uh, and proofread, proofread your resumes before submitting it to catch any typos and spelling errors um, because you don't want a recruiter to see that or a hiring manager either. So make sure to have someone proofread it before you start sending it out. Um, also, just be sure to use present tense for any current jobs and past tense for former jobs. I know I've seen that in the past, just, you know, proofread for consistency as well on that. Um, and it's okay to have different flavors of your resume. You know, you can tailor your resume to the role that you're applying to uh, with that specific industry experience. So you don't have to just have one and send it out. Just be sure to have one that, you know, has an overall experience on what you've been doing and then tailor it as you go to what specific roles you're applying to. Next slide, please. And here are just uh, two examples I wanted to show you all uh, on the left, uh, you know, what not to do and on your right, a nice, clean, simple, easy to read resume that you should be um, kind of, you know, looking at of what you want to do. Um, with the left, I mean, already with the name off the bat, you know, she's using cursive, um, keeping it simple and just using the same font is good. Um, the email, make sure to have a professional email and no nicknames on there. So I would change that. Um, she's missing her location and her LinkedIn profile. Profile, I would add that in too. Um, and no pictures, please. You, we do not need that. You can take that out and it's just a waste of space. Um, and then with the objective and summary, you don't need both. You can just pick one. Um, and so summary, again, just a couple sentences to just give you an overall impression of what you've been doing. Um, education, missing her major. So I would include that. And um, I would put it at the bottom um, of your resume. And then with work experience, I see here um, really didn't put in specific um, examples of what she's been doing as an accounting intern. So, uh, you know, need to sell the accounting experience a little better, uh, explain the projects and contributions that you've made. Um, that really helps. And also don't put in abbreviations in your explanations um, because not everyone will know what you're talking about. So just make sure that you're uh, making that concise and easy to read and list any metrics as well. Um, then I guess with the last one, I would say the, the cashier experience wouldn't be relevant here. Um, since we're looking at, you know, office assistant and accounting entered more office, um, experience, uh, would be preferable. So I would take out that last part. So just kind of an example of kind of what we look at. And then with the right, you know, it's nice and easy to read, same font, clean, um, you know, I can go through the summary and get an overview of what this candidate did, highlights um, with the bullet points, and then it's all relevant experience as a personal assistant. I have the year she worked there, where, um, and education at the bottom. So this is kind of what we're looking for on the right-hand side um, of a clean, you know, concise resume. And that's it. Awesome. So we are going to jump to the personal brand section. And I mentioned I'm going to focus more on social media, but there are tons of resources out there if you want to learn more about like building your own website or blog or business cards. Um, we're going to focus on social media right now because digital first impression is so important right now, right? This is your personal reputation. And this is how, um, as Lindsay mentioned, a lot of recruiters will find candidates, will look through their personal profiles to just check out and see what kind of person they are, what their experiences are. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, next slide please. So I'm gonna walk through how to set up a social media strategy for yourself. And I wanna preface with, there are five steps and it's really as much as you want to get out of it. I don't want social media to feel like something you um, have to do or you know you really hate it but you feel like you have to keep up with it. Social media is best when you can be yourself and find something that you're really interested in that you want to connect with others, have conversations, learn new things, join groups. So 
first and foremost, you want to set realistic goals that you'll want to keep up with. Um, so really think about what do you want to get out of social media? Do you want to expand your network and make new connections? Maybe find a mentor. Um, do you want to use it to find a job? Do you want to use it to learn about other companies? Um, so really think about that. How much time do you have to dedicate to social media? Because that will help you determine how and when you're going to post and how much. Um, really think about what social channels are important for your goals, your industry, your dream job. Um, there are just some kind of highlights for each channel. I would say the main, obviously for LinkedIn, we're going to talk about LinkedIn a lot. And that's super important for job um, searching and finding industries and kind of sharing your thought leadership. Um, Twitter is great for really current conversations and sharing news. Um, and Instagram is great if your personal brand has a lot of visuals associated with it. Maybe you're in the apparel industry or beauty. Um, and then Facebook, I really use that for more personal connections, but a lot of people find really great LinkedIn or Facebook groups to join there too. So it really just depends on your goals. Um, and then think about what other materials or resources you might need. Um, business cards, website, portfolio. Um, but again, the main thing we'll talk about here is social media. So that's the first step. Next slide, please. So before you hop on social or Twitter and LinkedIn and start, you know, tweeting away, writing away, be really mindful and write out kind of who are you? What do you care about? What are your values? Um, this will help you start to determine what kind of content you're going to post, um, what kind of groups you want to join, who you want to follow and who you want to connect with. And it really will help you build up your brand foundations, right? It's your image, your mission, your values, what do you care about and, and your vision, right? What are your goals for <clears throat> now and in the future? So seems maybe a little bit obvious, but don't skip this step because it'll really help you personalize your channels and your strategy. Next slide, please. Third step is to do a quick audit, right? So go to Google, search your name, full name, and see what comes up. <clears throat> Make sure that all of the channels that are publicly visible are have only content that you want people to see. So if it's your Facebook and you don't want that to be viewable, check privacy settings and, and lock all of that down. If it's your Twitter and your LinkedIn and you want that to be visible, um, make sure that, again, you don't have any content on there you wouldn't want anyone to see. Um, and really check for consistency across profiles. So you can see that when I Googled myself, my Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram came up in that order. And you can actually see for me, I have all different profile photos. I have different cover photos. And that's because my goals right now are not for, they're not to find a job. They're to join conversations, um, expand my network, and really build up my following. And I use each of these channels really differently. So I choose to express myself differently on those. But if you are looking to use your channels to find a job, I would say consistency is key. So using the same photos across channels. Um, really determine your visual language. So if you don't have a headshot, just get someone to take a photo of you. Even an iPhone is fine. If you're, um, if you're outside with natural light, um, Usually that photo will be great. Bust up is great um, just so people can see your smiley, happy face. And then a cover photo or those background photos you see, pick something that isn't super distracting but fits with your kind of your lifestyle, your goals, your industry. For me, I picked Austin just because that's really relevant to my job and my career right now on LinkedIn. So that can be, you know, your something about your city, your industry anything like that. And then determining your, your brand voice. And that's where that previous step uh, comes into play and is so important. I think the number one rule is, is be yourself and write like yourself. Don't try to sound too fancy or, um, you know, use a lot of flowery language to try and sound super smart. Just be yourself. That's really what people are on social for is to make personal connections with people. And obviously each channel is different, right? Twitter is a little more conversational and casual. 
LinkedIn is a little more formal, professional. Um, and then Instagram for me is totally informal. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see how my bios for each channel kind of go with my goals, right? LinkedIn, I'm really there to find connections, find mentors, but also mentees. So it's a really, it's professional content. You know, I talk about my professional background, my school and my personal interests, but it's still professional, um, still approachable and I've written it to be very friendly. Um, Twitter is more kind of casual and playful, but still informative. Um, if you're using Twitter, you want your bio to be a snapshot of who you are so that people know um, if they want to follow you. And you can use keywords in your bio like I do so that when people search, you appear in those searches and they want to follow you. And then Instagram, that's just, again, that's silly for me. Chihuahua mama because I love my dogs. Next slide, please. So after you've done an audit and picked what channels you want to focus on, Determine your strategy. So make a plan for posting and how you're going to stick to it. So based on your goals, make a plan for how many posts you want to share per week. I think to start three to four posts per week is great. Um, based on your narrative foundations, kind of your personal brand voice, determine what kind of content you want to share. So, you know, industry news, blogs, links to content you, that you found really helpful for your industry or something you found interesting, share that. Share that with some personal commentary, why you thought that was interesting. Maybe you have a different take on it. Maybe you have some personal experience you can relate to it. Questions and polls are always great to start conversations, especially in algorithms for LinkedIn. They decide what shows up in feeds by what has the most engagement. So ask questions, tag people, um, really use those little tricks to get your posts seen more. Images are always great for all channels. Videos are also wonderful. If you feel comfortable being on camera and you have, you know, a couple of minutes of a conversation that you want to talk about, try just doing selfie style um, video. That's really taking off on LinkedIn where a lot of personal influencers are using that to stand out in the feeds and just have a more open forum for conversation. So if you do that, yeah, selfie style, make sure the natural light is on you, quiet background so you're not picking up too much noise. And that level of quality is totally fine for video. And then figure out when you're going to take time to post. So do you have maybe 30 minutes a day when you read news that you can just quickly schedule a post? Do you have maybe commute time on a bus or waiting for a bus? that you can use that. Um, find little pockets of your day so that doesn't feel like a big to-do list on your item, but really just a, a fun way to use your free time. Next to, uh, slide, please. So when I say scheduling, that's so you can not have to share everything one-off. You can kind of schedule it out so that you have content that's ready to go. You just wanna make sure that you don't schedule anything that could be like if there's some crisis that comes up check your scheduled content to make sure it's not going to be offensive or sensitive to that time but otherwise you're fine buffer is free you get to connect three social accounts so you can schedule out posts for linkedin facebook twitter um and then tweet that so that's the one i would recommend if you're focusing more on linkedin scheduling content Twitter, if you mainly use Twitter, definitely use TweetDeck. That's also free. And you can create streams for um, the kinds of content you want to see. So it just helps you organize your, your Twitter feed. Next slide, please. Building your network. So this is, you know, once you've set up your channels, your bio, your photos are ready to go. Maybe you've sent a few posts out. Import your contacts. Um, all the social channels will prompt you to do this. So go ahead and do that. Add your friends, colleagues, professional contacts, family if you want to, um, and then find and join groups on LinkedIn or Facebook that are relevant to your interests. Um, follow influencers, experts, thought leaders. Just search, like if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, search like I did brand management um, because I'm new to this role and I wanna learn from others who have been in it for a while. You can search that, click on LinkedIn. Um, you can see I searched brand management and groups, click on that, and it'll bring you a list of relevant groups that you can join. Request to join, I could see that 
I have several contacts in this group already. Um, so this looks like a good join, good group for me to request to join, so I will. So once you get into that group, ask questions, comment on other people's posts, like and share, so that you're an active part of that conversation and, and people will want to interact with you. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is kind of a 201 kind of extra step. Um, you can look at your social profiles and they will tell you what kind of posts are working and what are not. So this is a free, this is analytics.twitter.com. So it's just the back end of Twitter. It shows you all the results for your tweets and your profile. So you can search and see what tweets are performing and what aren't. So you can get an idea of what's resonating with your audience and focus on that. And then on the next slide, LinkedIn also has great analytics. Um, you can view results for your profile to see who's looking at your profile, what industries they're in, what companies they're in. But then you can also look at post performance, and that's on the left, where you can see um, what companies people were in that saw your post, how many likes and views and all that good stuff you got. So you can look and see what posts are performing and what aren't, again, and um, focus on the ones that are driving a lot of conversation or likes. Next slide. So that was a fast crash course. I kind of wanted to cover the whole life cycle of social, if you will. A, a good rule of thumb for personal brand or social, if you're not sure what to post, is just make sure it's not offensive. Um, do some research and um, basically don't be a jerk on social and that's you'll be fine. From there, you'll figure out kind of what works and what doesn't. Take it one day at a time and learn more when you're ready. There are a ton of resources, um, and I've linked some here that are really great. And feel free to reach out to me as well if you have any questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, today um, what I wanted to focus on is job searching. So as we all know, job searching um, can feel like a job in it as itself, right? So really what I'm wanting to do is provide a few tips um, and insight towards one, reducing the timeline for um, uh, landing a job, as well as getting more, t uh, getting more value out of um, your time spent job hunting. So um, we're going to start with three smart ways to attract recruiters to your LinkedIn profile. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So as LinkedIn, um, you'll hear, you'll, you'll start to notice it's a reoccurring theme when talking about um, job searching and um, when in the job market. And uh, just for a little bit of insight, LinkedIn, uh, Ninety percent of recruiters use LinkedIn on a regular basis when prospecting candidates for particular roles. Um, so studies show that about 122 million people received an interview through LinkedIn, um, with about 35.5 million having been hired by a person they connected with on the site. Um, so to kind of go over a few things um, within the um, yeah within this slide specifically, three crucial steps to attracting recruiters. So one, um, a good rule of thumb is to get two to three recommendations from each job you've had. Um, it's good to kind of get a, a variety of recommendations. So whether it be a colleague, manager, um, uh, maybe a direct report, if you've had direct reports and kind of mix it up. That way you can um, yeah have a variety of resources. Um, secondly, a LinkedIn profile with a picture gets 21 times more profile views than nine times more uh, connection and nine times more connection requests. So some tips for your profile picture um, is to dress professionally, of course, um, by wearing attire that complements, you know, body style, um, hair, skin tone, things of that note, but also avoiding uh, wearing clothing with textures and patterns or logos. Um, it's super important to also show your personality in your picture. So while trying to stay professional, also a really good idea to show personality. Um, so LinkedIn data shows that you only have about five to 10 seconds uh, to impress a potential employer online. Um, so one of the first thing um, they're gonna see is your headline. Um, so your headline should communicate your area of expertise, um, your industry uh, and your uniqueness. Um, so, you know, what sets you apart? You know, what, what makes you special essentially? Um, and then, uh, if you're in the job search, um, updating your profile more often uh, than um, once every 90 days is imperative. Uh, so if your profile was last touched uh, three months ago, LinkedIn might assume it's not as uh, current or relevant as profiles updated within the last couple of days or weeks. Um, so next slide. 
So what do recruiters want? Um, and then if we can go to the next slide after that. So a recruiter, uh, what recruiters want to see, right? A recruiter uh, knows what they need in a candidate. So, um, you know, a lot of them use keyword uh, searches um, and Boolean searches to find candidates. And so it's important to um, implement some keywords that's going to help you uh, pop up in these algorithms. So as a job seeker, um, it's your responsibility to make your profile keyword optimized so that you show up in these search results. Um, so without a keyword strategy of your LinkedIn uh, profile, um, you might get lost in the crowd. Um, so it's important to do research on the job um, uh, that you're looking for, as well as job descriptions. Look for words that um, constantly pop up in these job descriptions that align with what you're looking for and start implementing that in your LinkedIn profile. Um, that way, you, yeah, like I said, you start popping up in this, these algorithms. Um, and sending personalized messages um, is also cr uh, critical. Um, so subject lines are extremely important to grab recruiters' attention. Um, you know, sometimes it's uh, it can even beneficial to get fun with it and uh, add a catchy phrase or include similarities um, that you may see that you have with the recruiters. So whether maybe you come from the same town or maybe you're part of the same organizations or um, went to the same school, things like that, um, and try to find some common ground. That way uh, it kind of sets you apart. Um, and next slide, slide three. So this is essentially just a recap um, of all of the above, right? On how to utilize LinkedIn when job seeking. Um, so another um, uh, thing to kind of, if you want to go the extra mile um, and uh, and it's within your means, uh, the premium version also has a few major feature differences. Um, so LinkedIn premium, uh, you get more profile searches um, while free gives you about a hundred while the first level of paid gives you about 300. Um, so the ability to see who's viewed your profile across the last 90 days as compared to the free version that shows only five days. So there's just a couple nuances in the premium that uh, is beneficial when job seeking. So if, like I said, if it's within your means, um, I definitely uh, recommend um, uh, getting the premium version. Um, next slide. So multi-platform visibility, uh, visibility. So kind of switching gears here um, towards utilizing more than one platform. So while LinkedIn is super important, um, different recruiters utilize different platforms, right? And there is um, there is a long list of platforms out there. Um, these are some of the major ones, right? LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor um, are ones that a lot of corporate recruiters use. Monster and Career Builder, a lot of agency recruiters utilize. Um, and there's, like I said, there's even more. Um, that are specifically geared towards executive uh, recruiting or maybe even technical recruiting, things like that. Um, so it's, if you have a very niche role that you're going for, maybe worth doing some research as to what job um, boards specialize in that uh, particular area and then putting your resume um, uh, and putting your credentials on that platform. Um, and it's also important to remain consistent with your credentials across multiple platforms because um, you may have recruiters that come across your profile on multiple platforms and if they see discrepancies might re you know raise a couple red flags as opposed uh, as far as um, you know um, um, just your credentials and you know what you're looking for as far as roles uh, next slide so targeting companies and roles um, so while it is important to ca uh, cast a wide net um, you don't want to cast too wide of a net um, so um, you know, applying to too many roles can turn off recruiters off as it gives more of uh, the impression that you're just more interested in getting your foot in the door as opposed to being interested and passionate about the role. Um, and while and while you might think like, why is that necessarily a bad thing? It's sometimes can be perceived as a bad thing because um, hiring managers really want people who are dedicated and passionate about the role. Um, you know, they don't, you know, they may um, be scared that candidates are going to get their foot in the door and then leave within six months when they find a better opportunity or something like that. So um, yeah, you know, you want some tips kind of to narrow down that search while still keeping it um, uh, as a wide net um, is identifying top one to two industries um, you're interested in. Um, then do some research and, you know, uh, identify the top three to five companies within those industries that uh, you're interested in. Um, and then once you have those identified, maybe identifying the top one to two organizations, so more so business units. So whether that be like marketing, sales, client success, et cetera, um, within those companies, and then the top one to three roles within those organizations. Um, this is going to allow you to, like I said, um, uh, keep a narrow focus, but while still 
um, casting that wide net um, to uh, increase your chances of getting a hit. Uh, next slide. So utilizing your existing uh, network. So um, yeah, utilizing, uh, so networking is super important. And while having an amazing resume, utilizing all the platforms, all that is super important. Um, experts say about upwards of 70 to 85% of open positions are filled through networking. Um, so going the extra mile on networking is going to be critical in your job search um, as far as shortening the timeline to landing a role. Um, so you want to work smarter and not harder, right? Um, a lot of people have a much more robust network than they think. Um, so, you know, thinking of friends, former colleagues, former managers, family members, neighbors, um, there's a lot of people at your disposal who are willing to help you. Um, and, you know, the first step is just letting them know you're in the job market. Um, you know, referral programs are super critical and significant in almost every company. Um, Big Commerce, you know, just as an example, has a referral program where um, you know, we are recruiters are um, required to um, uh, look at all referrals, right? And um, most likely even hop on a call and uh, get get an interview. So if you come in as a referral, it's almost ninety percent more likely that you're going to get a, at least a first round interview. Um, so yeah, you know, let them know that you're in the market. And when reaching out to your network, make sure that you're prepared to help them help you. Um, so having your updated resume ready to go, your LinkedIn profile, um, you know, ready to go, and a brief description of what uh, you're looking for, um, and giving them. Uh, somewhat of a narrow focus of roles that you're interested in makes it a lot easier for your network to help you because it allows them to know what to look for as opposed to just saying, I'm in the job market and um, you know I'm interested in this company um, because there's so many roles, right? And they might not know who to talk to, what organizations to reach out to. So giving them that narrow focus really helps you. Um, next slide. So continuing to grow your network. Um, so yeah, once you identify companies and organizations that interest you, um, start researching employees um, and uh, uh, yeah, employees that work in those companies and organizations, um, reaching out to them, just introducing yourself. Um, and remember the intent is to make new connections and form new relationships, not just going straight to figuring out how they can help you. Um, people are a lot more inclined to help when it's uh, kind of, a, when it's an opportunity to make a new connection, um, as opposed to, like I said, just um, someone looking to see how they can help. Um, so upon reaching out, offer the, uh, to take them out to coffee or, mit, or meet in an appropriate and informal fashion. Uh, conversation, I think, is the best tool towards um, growing relationships and uh, sustaining relationships. Um, and remember to use these conversations as learning opportunities, um, again, as opposed to solely finding out how they can help you. Um, so learning more about their role, about the organization, what a day in the life looks like, um, what organizations they work with, things like that. And that's honestly going to give you a better idea um, to understand if that role in that company or that organization is the right fit for you as well um, because it goes both ways um, and so once you've connected and built consistent communication building an occasional cadence um, of communication helps maintain sustained relationships and can honestly um, be really beneficial in the long run um, because while they're not might not be a current role open um, that is the right fit um, roles are opening you know every week and so if you are you know uh, keeping communication once a month or maybe once every two weeks and just kind of dropping notes, letting them know that you're still interested, um, things like that. Um, you, you never know what an opportunity is going to arise. And um, if you're top of mind, they will reach out to you. Um, similarly, maintaining relationships with recruiters um, who have supported you in previous job opportunities um, and setting yourself apart in those conversations. So, you know, uh, sending thank you notes to either recruiters or the interview team. Um, if, you know, you're going to do thank you notes, I would definitely prioritize the interview team. But, you know, if you feel inclined to send one to a recruiter too, um, it definitely will help, you um, uh, you know, stay top of mind, like I said, with the recruiter and um, that memory will stick, right? And staying top of mind is just, in my opinion, will always go the longest way um, as far as job searching. Um, next slide. Uh, so networking events. Uh, so utilizing online communities such as Built in Austin uh, to stay up to date with professional current events in your city um, is super important. There's always um, so much going on within your city, whether um, it's just about finding um, those events and uh, yeah, and and just um, 
signing up for them and RSVPing and going. So utilizing event platforms such as Eventbrite can really help you um, uh, find networking events near you. Uh, and when attending networking events, always have a respectable respectable amount of resumes or business cards ready to go. Um, if you and I would also include LinkedIn information on both, um, because the minute that you do give them a resume or you do give them a business card, they will go to your LinkedIn um, to find out more about you. Um, so always have those on deck ready to give to new connections. Um, and then always be prepared for an ad hoc interview. Um, so you never know when you're going to meet your future employer. Um, Personally speaking, I got my job at Big Commerce um, through a networking event, a referral event, and um, I had an ad hoc interview um, at the event. So I met my hiring manager and she decided to do an interview right then and there, right? So you never know um, when that's gonna happen and you always wanna be prepared. So always have your elevator pitch ready to go. Um, just always be ready to speak on your experience and being able to articulate what you're looking for in your opportunities. Um, yeah, and you never know when uh, you'll land an interview. Uh, might land it by accident. So, um, yeah, so that is it for networking events.